So in just one week, Intitude 2001 in Hanover starts and live at the exhibition grounds. Yes, we can meet physically live again and at the same time digitally on the platform. And uh, with that countdown, welcome to the final interview preview talk for this special edition. We also invited special guests and industry leaders and CEOs from Autodesk, from Trimble, and from Hexagon. And we are talking about the geospatial industry in transition. In fact, the geospatial industry is undergoing a process of major change. The rapid speed of digitalization is setting the pace. The keywords here are digital twins and building information modeling. Artificial intelligence and robotics will support many tasks in the future. And the goal of a sustainable climate neutral economy is an additional motor and motivation for fundamental reorientation. So sustainability is also becoming a determining factor for the industry. 40% of global carbon dioxide emissions are associated with the construction industry. In Germany, for example, the construction sector is responsible for half of all waste. So the recycling of materials is absolutely below average. And uh, the geospatial industry can and wants to change this together with my guests today. <laughs> there is a huge potential for energy and material savings and plenty of optimization opportunities in terms of efficiency, cost savings and sustainability. So I am really very pleased to present our three guests now to you. We have Roland Zelles. He is Senior Vice President, Global Territory Sales from Autodesk. Very welcome. Hi. <laughs> Hello. And you can also see here on the stage, on the screen, Thomas Haring, President, Hexagon Geosystems and CEO Leica Geosystems, part of Hexagon. Hello, Thomas Haring. Hello, zusammen. <laughs> Hello. Freut mich sehr. Hello, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Because good morning is to Roland, to Ronald Bisio, Ron Bisio, Senior Vice President, Geospatial at Trimble. Hello. Good evening, good afternoon, and uh, for those of us here in North America, good morning. Thanks for joining us. So learn and discover how these leaders are positioning their companies on the mega topics of digitalization and sustainability and what role artificial intelligence and robotics play in their companies. Roland, Thomas, Ron, I'm glad you to have you. I'm glad that you have time to share your experience right now with all of us. We are really excited. So let's get started. And um, we said we start with Roland Zelles and Autodesk. So uh, just let us start. Where are you at the moment? I, I, I think you are in Munich. Yes, I'm cloud, uh, south of Munich, <laughs> and I'm very happy to meet you all. Perfect, you. perfect. And I saw on LinkedIn that you are excited about finally getting back to traveling. Are you looking forward to Intergeo? Unfortunately not. I have a different appointment. Oh, okay, okay. But perfect that you are right here with us and i think you start your presentation now and it opens with a short impulse and uh, it's about transformation of the construction industry and so the stage is yours thank you very much and i'm really pleased to be here with you um you know i'm kind of a veteran i think i was at the old gear i think like i was embarrassed a little earlier with 1985 so i really come from this industry, love it, and I'm really excited to be on this um, on this talk today. Um, I want to give you a little bit of the, the story, I think, and, and what we do and, and why we do things. I think we currently seven and a half billion people on Earth, of which 3.5 billion live in cities. And when you follow a lot of the conversation, I think it's kind of a challenge because we will have a growing population uh, or towards 10 billion, you know, there's different forecasts by 2050 and about 7 billion will be in cities. So a lot of people will be living in cities, which requires us, if you want to just keep the housing available for everybody, to have 13,000 buildings per day and have to build infrastructure, which would actually every year would last 30, would be 30 times around the earth on streets and railways. So quite massive. And I think this is really causing some issues on top of what's Our going on. Facing challenges like never before. With natural 
natural disasters growing and population rising fast. Our failing infrastructure is under increasing pressure. Now more than ever, that's one of the reasons I think you saw the kind of the announcement of building investing in infrastructure in the US, but also across Europe. I think we will have these big budgets coming up. And I think for me, there's two mega themes. One is the decarbonization of the industry. And the second one is digitization. Actually, they are one theme. And I believe they belong together. You cannot do decarbonization without digitization. And here we play a key role. Uh, this was also supported by a recent study from Bitcom um, when you just look at the, the goals of Germany, which has to go from 805 megatons of CO uh, carbon um, to 543, and what role the various industries can play. And as Ms. Wenzel mentioned earlier, I think in, in Germany, if you look to the balance, it's 14% of the carbon footprint is buildings. The construction industry is, is more than double of that, and globally it's around 40%. So there's a lot we can do. What we, what we do on our offering, I think one of the key fundamentals, one is the openness and the second one is around standard. The openness is to make sure that we, we provide access to anybody and every company to the, to the tools and also don't create kind of prisoners in the file formats, et cetera. Make sure that everybody can use that. On top of that, I think supporting all global standards or whether it's OGC, Building Smart, or Open Design uh, Alliance. And the reason we do that, I think if you want to move towards a digital twin, and I think a digital twin is a digital replica of a built asset that has a, is a dynamic digital reflection of the physical itself. And if you want to do that, we have to be able and allow to become a data consumer from any source or also be a data feeder to any other system. And that's one way to, to allow and to manage a digital handover. Uh, have smarter operations and greater insight. And that's one big way to actually contribute to the reduction of the carbon. And the other one definitely is around automation. Um, just the post COVID, I think how you rearrange the, the offices with generative design and automation, I think there will be a lot of requirements to do that well. At the same time, there's not enough experts and employees available. So we need to provide automation and I think and we believe that automation will be a big area to contribute to that. Uh, second one is also to allow and combine automation with machine learning. And this is especially something we're doing, which is a tool called SpaceMaker, where you can do automated optimization and planning of apartments in, in, in buildings. And then also using a lot of the intelligence to optimize whether it's you know the um, um, availability of daylight and sunlight the glassing optimizing all of the of the infrastructure in a way that you optimize the carbon footprint and you minimize the uh, impact you have to kind of the natural surrounding and with several of our customers, we have built something which is called like a carbon impact calculator, which will allow real time already to uh, simulate the carbon footprint and helping directly to operate. Of course, we cannot do everything alone. Um, so we work with partner and uh, the partners and I think we announced a partnership with ESRI, a big one. And the main driver and the motivation is really to combine the science of where with the make anything idea. ...about the surrounding environment, while Autodesk delivers a building information modeling process for structures. Combined, it's a groundbreaking approach, allowing architects, city planners, builders, and civil engineers to collaborate more effectively than ever, leading to better designs and cost savings. It streamlines planning, as multiple scenarios are easily visualized to drive better decision making. In design, GIS content is quickly imported from Esri's ArcGIS platform, the most authoritative system of record. BIM processes add meticulous design data to structural assets. So the real idea is to combine the GIS and the serving industry with everything we do in the, on the BIM side and then providing the best of both worlds. That's why we do the partnership and that's why I'm motivated 
to work in this industry and help you. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing this presentation with us and the uh, digital twins and the convergence, GIS and BIM, and um, yeah, and also um, Autodesk's strong commitment in uh, sustainability. That's great. And um, yeah, that's perfect because last week I talked about tracking climate change with geodata, also with Jürgen Schumacher from ESRI, and you just uh, mentioned your partnership with ESRI. Uh, so why did you do that and what is the benefit um, for your customers? You know, I think it's relatively obvious. I think, you know, whatever, whatever infrastructure or, or, or um, map you build, something will be done on it. You build an infrastructure on it, a railway, you have waters, lakes, and you have buildings. Or the other way around for us, it's uh, on any, any building, any infrastructure has to build on something, which is land. So I think a lot of customers were actually struggling. And, you know, that's why I mentioned there's, there's the openness of the, of the file formats. There's all the standards we support. But at the same time, we're also working with one specific partner and guarantee with joint products, which we have available, to guarantee a seamless um, appearance of data and also a seamless workflow. So this is something we stand for, and that's why we work very close together to allow customers to make this very smooth. Mm. Do you have some examples? Like, I, may, I guess uh, there was, uh, I remember there was the, the Digital City of Paris where you also worked on together? Yeah, yeah I think there's, the, the rebuild, I think, of the Notre Dame, I think, is a oh. big thing in, 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 in Paris, of course. I think where we're working a lot because I think they want to make sure it's, it's ready and can be visited when the Olympics come back. I think we did the infrastructure planning for the floods. I think we have some of the experience here in Germany, unfortunately, uh, making sure we protect it. And then some large customers like um, the, the German Rail or SBB or like one big project. I think if you drive on holidays for the German ones around Munich, the A99, which is the autobahn around that, mm -hmm. uh, with the autobahn direction, I think we worked there together and they did the planning of the extension of the highway uh, together with us and his way. Yeah, that's really awesome. And um, you also brought the examples about saving a carbon dioxide and um, yeah, what exactly do you do as a company? You already mentioned some examples, but um, how do you support your customers to do that? Um, we talked about in the introduction that the construction industry has such a huge ecological footprint, but um, yeah, how, how do you support your customers to do that? It's you know, it's a big theme and I, it's actually for me personally and it's always good to start with what yourself so i think the house i, I sit in here i think is definitely carbon negative uh, because i have a roof uh, uh, with the battery so i think i hardly need any external energy but i think this is uh, same thing is for autodesk i think where of course and this is kind of the the downside sometimes you have to buy certificates to make sure you you're carbon neutral I think it's important you do something yourself before you you explain what others can do and should do. And then the big focus is construction industry. As you mentioned earlier, the 40%. Um, so there's two areas. One is renovation retrofit of infrastructure and, of course, the new one. And I think where we work with governments a lot and, and try also to explain to have a BIM mandate, which, for instance, we have on infrastructure in Germany, which says, okay, but at a certain time, you have to fulfill a certain BIM level, BIM level one, two, or three. Level three would be the reuse and run into operations, use the data. By what project volume? So if you do that for new buildings, I think you can move to a carbon neutrality for new buildings. You still have the impact of delivery, bringing the goods to the construction site, et cetera, but you can help to calculate that and reduce it. And the same is on renovation retrofit as I mentioned earlier, where you can use artificial intelligence to, to measure what you do, what is your impact, and then use that one to constant, continuously improve mm. the, the, the footprint itself. And, and the calculators I mentioned earlier, which we use to constantly improve and, and make mm. them available for the customers to, to show the uh, design alternatives between what customers want and also what implications they have. And I think this is typically very important that you can see your own implications and also what you can do to improve it despite mm -hmm. the technical possibilities. Mm -hmm. 
So thank you very much, Roland Zelles and Autodesk for the moment right now. So this was just our first opening session of this InterGeoCO talk. We will also hear the presentations and the statements of Hexagon and Triple right now. And if you have questions to Roland Zelles, we will do the panel talk in about uh, 10 or 15 20 minutes and you can ask your questions for example at Autodesk or at Roland Zelles in the chat right now and we will answer them later because right now we are directly moving to our second guest Thomas Haring. How do you do? Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. That's great. That's great. So I think you prepared also a short introduction, a presentation. And um, we are really interested in uh, Thomas Haring's presentation, President Hexagon Geosystems and CEO Leica Geosystems, part of Hexagon. And his topic today is the sustainable journey towards digital realities and an autonomous future gets momentum. So. We're excited. Please start your presentation. Thanks a lot. And hello and a good day, wherever you may be joining us from. I'm speaking out of our experience center in Erbruck from our innovation factory. And it's always great to be here among so much history, presence and future. I'm delighted and honored to present you highlights of our journey towards digital realities and an autonomous future, as said before. And I'm sure you will be convinced that the journey gets a lot of momentum. Let's start the journey from the beginning. I think many of you know, and many of you have been part of that journey. And many of you know that this year is an extraordinary year for us because we are celebrating 100 years of innovation, Herr Bruck, our powerful innovation factory here in the Eastern part of Switzerland. And with that, we celebrate thousands of people all around the world who have been with us over the years. And if I have the correct, correct information, which most likely I have, then the first exhibition of the Deutsche Geodetag took place 100 years ago in Stuttgart. And I'm sure, and of course, our development from Wildherbruck to Leica Geosystems and thus part of Hexagon went hand in hand with the increased relevance of the Intergeo over all these years. I've been joining the Intergeo only for 18 years, but for me, it became much more than a conference or exhibition. It's an annual highlight it's great to meet the geospatial community and many of you and many new people interested in increasing the geospatial future this year in Hanover as well. This picture does not show our retro booths which we have prepared for Hanover, it's not, but it's roughly 100 years ago. And with that, I would like to show you a short video about the impressive development and our journey that goes on and on. Since its inception, Leica Geosystems has defined and continues to revolutionize measurement and positioning technologies. This remarkable history of pioneering solutions for a whole spectrum of industries has been launched 100 years ago in Switzerland by an experienced surveyor, a talented entrepreneur, and a skilled engineer. It's their fledgling Swiss factory that has become the beginning of Leica Geosystems the place of never ceasing thirst for innovation. The legacy of Wild Heerbrug has continued throughout the 20th century, claiming many world's firsts, and it's still alive in our time. Now as part of Hexagon and its global vision for the autonomous future, powered by data. Today, even a hundred years since founding, Leica Geosystems continues to shape the world as the leader of surveying innovation. Leica Geosystems, when it has to be right. How should I summarize these 100 years? I think the best way to do it is innovation was important 100 years ago when Bild Herr Bruck was established and is essential today. And that's something we are living day by day. Learning from the past means for us winning the future we have the impressible urge to spread innovation and just technology to solve customer and social problems and are firmly anchored in our corporate culture with that kind of spirit. Capturing relevant data, ensuring the highest data quality and gaining the desired geospatial information has always been part of our DNA. Last year, we proudly introduced pure surveying and much more as a theme for the virtual intergeo. This year, we have put together another exciting program which offers enough space for personal interaction with our experts, either virtually 
or hopefully live in Hanover. Please do me a favor and let our expert and solutions inspire you. Our pure purpose is to support you in putting your data to work in all the different industries you are working in. We have countless great examples, highly differentiated innovations on our journey. One example is the Leica GS18i, a GNSS rover with inclination and imaging technology. Many might remember the forget to bubble challenge, which we had back in the Intergeo 2017 with the Leica GS18T, the world's first GNSS with inclination and tilt technology at that time. By the way, the Leica GS18i is nominated for the Wichmann Award. Please vote for it and challenge our experts to talk about all the use cases you can do with this. But now let me talk about another important chapter of our journey, which started back in 2017. In 2017, we announced the disruptive and design-driven Leica BLK 360. Since then, we have continued our disruption with the Leica BLK 3D, the Leica BLK 24-7, and the Leica BLK to go the first mobile BRK product with Grand Slam technology. All these products have received countless awards from all over the world. And I'm sure many of you have asked yourself, what will be next? Hopefully you have seen our nice keynote, which we have launched on September 7, because September 7 was an excellent day for us, a significant day. We have shifted from technology to opportunity. The journey towards autonomous solutions and digital reality has got an accelerator and a real boost. Because the new BLK to fly and the new BLK arc coupled with HXDR represent an unimaginable leap forward. Experience digital, oh, sorry, experience real autonomous reality capture within your grasp. Visit our booth in Hohenhofer, join us digitally and look at the products, the BLK to fly or the BLK um, arc and I'm sure you won't regret it, talking to our experts about that. Sustainability is a huge topic, um, was mentioned before. Let me briefly about, talk about that. Um, it should take up much more space and I would be very happy in Hanover to have discussions with you about that. We in Hexagon believe that our sustainability journey is determined both by the role of our products in the market, as well as our own processes. Our solutions contribute to environmental and social sustainability by improving efficiency, quality, and safety in a broad area of industries. But we did not talk so much about that. So that's why we have that slogan, do good, help others do good, talk about it, let others talk about it. We firmly believe that's the only way that we can take our responsibility and harmonize planet, people, and prosperity and accelerate sustainable developments. Our customer magazine, reporter issue 89, which will be available at the Intergeo, has a lot of content on why we are placing sustainability at the core of our business. A lot of customer success stories. Please enjoy the read. Beyond enabling other sustainable journeys, we have heard that before, we are also committed to lowering our impact on the environment and that of our supply chain and value chain. We are doing that constantly because driving a culture of sustainability within our company is going to be accelerated. To summarize, Join us in the journey towards autonomous solutions. There's plenty of more things which I have not shown you at HXDR, digital realities, what we can do with airborne and geospatial data in Hexagon content program, and many other things. Let us support you in putting your data to work, whatever needs you have, whatever problems you need to solve on a daily basis. Despite the challenges with the pandemic, we have decided to participate at the Intergeo physically and digitally with a strong team. If you have the chance to come in person, our roughly 100 colleagues will be very happy to serve you there. If you're not able to attend in person, please connect with us on all the different channels. We believe in the future. We will aspire to lead by example and demonstrate what can be done. Challenge us on that. Enjoy the time with us. We are always saying coming together is only the beginning. Working together is progress, of course. But delivering performance together, that's the real success. And we are really looking forward to many joint successes with all our customers from all around the world. So we would like to thank you for the trust in us. And for the ones who have not been yet to Hannover, please do me a favor. If you get offered a Lütje Lagen, trust me, be careful with that. I speak out of experience. So we really look forward to meet you in Hannover, showing us you our innovation and all the different things. 
And it would be really a pleasure to see you there. And I'm happy, of course, to meet you all there. But it's much more important that you meet our strong team, which can answer all your questions, maybe much better than I could do. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas Harring. And uh, yeah, thank you for these insights into Hexagon's ideas and innovations. Also, these uh, two um, new innovations you have brought with you, the BLK Arc and the BLK to Fly. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> We could see them, uh, actually. And also for taking us in the past, within the last 100 years of um, uh, your story, your history. So, um, but let's talk about the autonomous systems you also mentioned and the digital realities which will complement our reality and processes and will become more and more autonomous. And how exactly do you think will digital twins affect the world of engineers and surveyors? I think it will affect in the construction industry and similar industries as It has impacted in the manufacturing space or in the plant space where we have a lot of experience. It starts with capturing the data accurately, processing them, ensuring the quality. That's what we are all very good at. And then, of course, visualizing them, sharing them, collaborating with them, and keeping them alive. And that's something which is in our DNA that we try to really then put the data to work, how we call that. Because one thing is to have the data captured, but it's more important to use the digital twin, the digital realities, or whatever we want to call it, to really get insights out of that via artificial intelligence or via the experts working with these data. So for us, it's about different platforms which we have in place, like HXDR, which you have seen as well in the presentation shortly, which we, we are launching right now, um, or many other things like our content program, where you can have nice digital replicas of the world. And based on that, you can create your insights, or we help you on creating that via our own solutions. So we'll plenty of work to do for surveyors and engineers and many other disciplines. Yes, there is. And um, Thomas, you also showed or also um, mentioned that you will be present with a, a large booth at Intergeo, which will be also outside. I already heard about it. And uh, yeah, you already announced uh, some world firsts that you will present at Intergeo. And uh, what actually will visitors see? So these are the two things you brought with you in the studio, is it that? I, I'm sure there's much more to see. First of all, I would not call it large booth because compared to the past, it's still not so impressive. Okay. But of course, we are all facing the uh, challenges of the pandemic. But we are there. And I think what you can see is our people. You can talk to our people, our experts. That's important. You see the solutions which we have announced over the last couple of years. Um, you can see these two new friends here, the BLK Arc and the BLK to fly. You can see a new city mapper, how you can collect much faster airborne data. You can see software solutions around HXDR and many other software solutions. And you can see some of the evolution as well from the last hundred years, because I'm sure I have emotions to some of the products from the past. Many of you have emotions to that as well. And it's always good to sometimes reflect some years back and to see how technology has evolved and what we have done over all these years as an overall industry. And that's something which you can see and much more because come to visit our booth and then you might be surprised what else you might see. <laughs> that's great. And we are really looking forward to see you in Hanover. And even uh, to everybody who cannot travel to Hanover, everything will be available via sure. the digital platform, via the Hexagon platform, but also at Intergeos platform. So thank you very much for the moment, Thomas. We will talk about artificial intelligence, robotics, and so on later. We will also ask uh, our audience for some questions. So if you have questions to Hexagon, Hexagon, um, please ask them right now in the chat via at Hexagon and we will answer them in about 10 minutes because right now it's time for Trimble and Ron Bizio, he's Senior Vice President Geospatial. Welcome Ron. Thank you so much. Let me, uh, let me share my screen. Yes, really that quick. would be perfect. Okay. Because you also prepared a presentation, a short presentation to bring us I into did. that topic right now. And uh, yep. I guess it's about connecting the physical earth to the digital world. So we would like to learn more about this. So please start right now, Ron Bizio. Great, just confirming you can see my presentation. Perfect. Great, thanks. 
First off, I would like to thank the organizers of Intergeo. I, I would really like to thank them for their perseverance over the past couple of years. This has been difficult for all of us. I can't imagine what it's like to be uh, organizers of an event as prestigious with such a long history as Intergeo. Um, but I actually think it's really interesting that this has actually given us an opportunity to move into a, you know, a, a whole new dimension of, of hybrid events. I was just looking at the participants um, that are on this session with us. I noticed that our distri distribution partner from Minnesota and from Southern California are both in the part participants list. I pretty much guarantee I would have never met the two of them together in, uh, in Hanover. So it's nice for them to be here. I'm really thrilled that this year we're gonna be able to have our booth in Hanover and our team is excited to welcome everybody there. And we're gonna be able to participate with the global audience for geospatial via the hybrid event. So again, appreciate uh, the perseverance of Intergeo and I think your format is, is great moving forward. So uh, obviously COVID has been, been a difficult situation for everybody. What's been interesting is we've had one of our strongest years ever in the history of Trimble. Uh, in the middle of this. And I've been asked repeatedly, why, are, why is the, the industry so strong? And I think what it is, is that our customers, our surveying and engineering customers are serving some of the key industries that are driving the global economy. You think about road transportation, rail transportation, utilities, residential construction. These are all industries that are under incredible pressure um, through, um, through uh, COVID. And the, the need, the very obvious need that we're seeing on a daily basis to um, improve sustainability and address climate uh, change are, are what's driving our customers to be so busy. And, and what I think is great about that is the amazing technology that is showcased every year at Intergeo from Hexagon, from Autodesk, from Esri, from Trimble, all of us, the technology we're showcasing are helping our surveying and engineering customers. So if I look here, I, I love images of our customers. My 16 year old son asked me why I spend so much time on LinkedIn. And I just love seeing what our customers are doing with the technology. And if you look across road construction, we're making it safer to work on the side of the road by, by introducing things like inertial technology and tilt that can make it easier. Mobile mapping that keeps people out of the right of way. Uh, safety is a key component of all the technology that we're, we and the other companies at Intergeo are launching. And, and I think this is so, so important. Uh, on the rail side, it's interesting, you know, we have dedicated track surveying and, and scanning systems that are making it um, more precise for railways across Europe and North America, Asia to measure their track and to improve it so that people can commute to work when they get back to the offices. And so we can move goods across countries in a more efficient manner. I think these things are all really important. That image in the upper right, I love. Um, I'm not sure that's a recommended configuration, but our mobile mapping system has been installed on a, uh, on a shunting locomotive. And you can see that mobile mapping is uh, done with any platform possible. Monitoring down in the lower left, so important. Uh, we've seen so much work underground with tunneling and using of scanning total stations. So again, I think it's really important that all of the technology that we, we are developing and we, we showcase year after year at Intergeo is being used to help our surveying and engineering customers do their jobs. And I think this is so important. And I, I applaud my, my colleagues that are on the call and um, all of our employees for focusing on that. So, the, so then the question is, what comes next? What, you know, what are the technology trends we're excited about? That was sort of the theme of this session. And I, and I, and I, and I want to talk about that. Um, back in, I remember when we were in Hamburg, we launched the, uh, the, first, the world's first scanning total station, the, uh, the SX-10. And you know, the, we've really focused on bringing scanning into the traditional surveying and engineering workflow. And it's been incredibly well received around the globe. And you know, so the question is, what comes after that? What are we going to be focusing on now? And there's really four key areas. We're going to continue that theme of sensor fusion uh, because there is so much benefit to our surveying and engineering customers. When we put IMU and GNSS together and allow them to work in, in, um, in new areas under, under denser and denser canopy and to be more productive and keep them out of the, uh, the right of way. 
Um, when we put a scanner and a total station together in a single instrument and make it so the workflow is easier um, to incorporate, uh, I think those things are so important. Mass data collection. Um, both uh, the gentleman from Autodesk and from Hexagon have talked about how we're going to be gathering so much more data. Our mobile mapping systems are actually, um, the, the nice thing is they're going in two different directions. They're getting easier to use and we're really focused on the ease of use of our systems. But at the same time, we're driving the cost down, which makes it so that our mobile mapping systems are more approachable for more customers around the globe. We're seeing far more use of our mobile mapping systems in Asia, Middle East, Latin America, um, as, the, as the price points come down and the ease of use goes up. I think that's something all of us in the industry are really focused on, and, and I think that's important. Data integration. Surveying and engineering customers are often not the end users of the data. The data needs to flow into Autodesk, needs to flow into Bentley, needs to flow into Esri. So we as an industry are really focused on improving that workflow and the cloud is going to make it so make that better. The uh, autom autonomous uh, feature extraction is going to improve that so we can more quickly move from point clouds imagery to answers that customers demand um, to help solve their problems um, for the global industries that I talked about. And finally, survey automation, making it so that all of our systems are easier to use. Um, our mobile mapping system, uh, sorry, our monitoring systems, for example making it so that they can be um, remotely monitored, remotely used, um, and improving that automation across the board. So again, Intigeo is all about technology and customers and future trends and bringing them all together. So uh, the great news for our customers and for all of us is our industry is incredibly robust. Um, there's so much innovation going on at all the companies that you're gonna be seeing at Intigeo. So I think that's really important. And finally, I think the gentleman from Autodesk did such a nice job of talking about sustainability. And I think it's important that we all look at what we're doing around that. I don't want to do our, our efforts uh, around sustainability from the Trimble Foundation justice. I would encourage you to go out and take a look at our website uh, on the Trimble Foundation. You can see the areas that we're focusing on around natural disaster relief, uh, female education empowerment, providing clean water, um, and this is this is goes from how we operate our company to where we make donations to how how we develop our system. So again, I encourage you to go take a look at that. And finally, what I would like to do is I would like to thank all of our customers, our partners, and our employees for being incredibly resilient through the, this difficult past two years. And as we as we as we uh, as we move into Hanover, and we and we look forward to seeing you in Hall 20 and uh, as well as in our sessions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ron Bizio, for this presentation. Thank you very much for your kind words, because as an organizer, it was really a tough year for all of us um, to sure keep that, uh, that industry dialogue that um, uh, still going <laughs> so that we can meet this year again. And uh, yeah, you just mentioned it. We're talking about um, the geospatial industry in transition and where do you think the geospatial industry will face the most transition within the next three to five years? Yeah, I think I think it's I think the industry is facing some, some similar changes to what we face every day. I, you know, back in we, I would have worked years ago with uh, software for doing my email. That's now all, all out on the cloud. We're seeing the same trend in, in our industry as well. I think the cloud is going to change things and I think the acceleration is growing dramatically. Again, I mentioned somebody begins a surveying job, they don't intend for it to stay in Trimble technology. It needs to go out to Autodesk, it needs to go out to Bentley Esri. The cloud is going to make facilitate that and accelerate that. It's going to allow for better data fidelity to downstream users. It's going to allow better visibility and it's going to allow better speed. Now, with that comes a lot of responsibility for custom companies like ours and all of our other companies. We have cybersecurity we have to worry about. We have GDPR we have to worry about. So these are all things that we have to be incredibly vigilant about, and we as a company are really focused on those things. Mm. So how can you help customers um, to stay in, in front of these changes that they are really well informed about the transition and how it's going on? 
uh, one of the things I always remark as I walk around the, the multiple halls of Intergeo every year is we throw a lot of technology at our customers. And I think it's really, really important that we always focus on the tasks that they're trying to do and how our technology benefits the surveying engineering community. If we stay focused on what they need to do and how they need to operate, how we keep them safer, how we make the data more accurate, how we ensure that they reliably bring the data home and how they're interoperable throughout the workflow. Um, I think if we do all those things, we'll really improve our customers, uh, 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 their lives and, and their work and allow them to focus on driving the global economy and improving sustainability. Thanks a lot, Ron. So we have Thank some you. more questions to all of you and we would like to open up our panel talk now and use the time and your expertise to go deeper into the discussion and um, maybe our chat partner, our editor Monika Rech can also share her screen right now with us. Hello Monika. <laughs> Hello from Cologne, to all of you. <laughs> yeah, this is Monica. She's our editor and she also prepared this talk. And she will also be in charge right now of the chat. Um, so if you have questions, I see Bruno Krensky is also saying hello and uh, has something to say. So uh, Monica, give us an oversight, an overview of what's going on in the chat. Yeah, there's uh, George Al Halabi. He says augmented reality is, a gra is great for visuals. So um, it's a statement. So I think the question uh, is why? Uh, what are you doing with uh, augmented reality? Do you integrate it in your tools in your products? Maybe to all of you. We start with A. Like I, I can start if you want. <laughs> I, think. No, I can go. I think. Uh, I think it's also. Um, to the to the earlier point, point Ron made, I think there's a lot of technology available, and I think the, the key is also to not get overwhelmed with technology. And I think um, argument reality is just another piece of technology we throw at people is to think about your business process and which are the most critical ones, and try to digitize them. I think that's probably the easiest way also to capture and finding the right balance between between technology and you know buzzwords, etc. So I think we for, for us I think it's quite keen to integrate um, kind of virtual reality, augmented reality, and this kind of bread and butter business because I think one thing we do as a company, a lot of people don't know, but I think a lot of the Hollywood studios, or actually all, use our tools for these virtual effects you see. I think probably one of the most famous firms I, I am personally proud we did is like Avatar. So I think we do a lot of this kind of mix, mix between real, reality and, and virtual and you have a hard time to figure that out. So we use it for all the 3D visualization. So basic, a basic thing is like, you know, having an architect to provide actually to the client uh, an, a, a, a virtual insight um, on the uh, uh, augmented is like, you know, having the real product uh, combined with the virtual improvements. And I think this is just helping. But as I said, I think it's a, it's a buzzword. People jump on. Mm -hmm. I really recommend everybody in the audience think about less the buzzwords, more like where do you have a direct commercial or regulation benefit and do that part first and then add all the other nice things. Mm -hmm. Any other statements on augmented reality? Yes, Maybe if, if, I, if I could add um, a concrete use case we see for augmented reality, and that's linked to a technology we have, which a company joined us recently, Immersal, is basically asset performance management. If you really capture your assets with reality capture and you want to make predictive maintenance, you can go with a smartphone and have the information directly at location. So all these kind of things like indoor mapping, indoor location, indoor navigation is something which is coming because it's a huge trend and that's something we can't do with GNSS inside as we all know. So how do we do that? How do we ensure that? And that's where technology comes together with the domain expertise as mentioned um, from the colleagues as well. Mm -hmm. And finally, I think I'll just add, you know, Trimble's been focused on augmented reality through our relationship with Microsoft and integrating HoloLens into our industry and help. It's almost kind of that next generation of 
when it's no longer just kind of a, a cool thing on the side, it becomes integrated into the workflows and our field software and, and other things so that people actually have more situational awareness of the information around them. My surveying, I'll actually be able to see the underground assets beneath me through a, through a virtual reality, augmented reality solution. So again. Mm -hmm. I think there is a problem with the connection. Ron, you were just interrupted at the end, um, but I think uh, we will go on. I don't know, Monica, shall we go on with the next question or shall we switch over to the artificial intelligence part? There is one other question uh, from Lisa Higgins, um, a question to the panel, to all of you. If you as business leaders could ask governments one thing regarding how we can embrace tech advancement, what would it be? So one question, how we could embrace tech advancements to the governments. Okay, I go, I go first again. <laughs> I would give every, every kid when they join school a tablet and move the education system digital to make sure the next generation and that's the future mm. is completely tech savvy. So no more especially books. for Germany, a big theme with a the federated system and I think a lot of um, slow development okay. in this area. So you think we have to start with the youngest? Sure. And I see, continue with the alphabetic order. Maybe then I'm next, Ron, if you don't mind. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so. Thank you, Thomas. So clearly edu education is something important. And then I think for us as an industry, it would be nice if regulations would be there where they help people and that we can overcome some of the things which maybe stop us in implementing the technologies which are really good for really solving customer solutions, customer problems. Yeah, And I think that's something where we are driving towards the industry. Sometimes is maybe faster. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, We have a lot of innovation, as we said, at the Intergeo. How can we apply it maybe faster with, of course, taking care of compliance and many other topics which are of key importance to all of us? It was not one sentence. It was a little bit more. Sorry for that. Ron. I, if, hopefully you can hear me now. Yes. Everything's fine. Yeah, the, the, the sub-Atlantic lines are working again. Um, so, uh, yeah, the I, I just expanding on what Roland said, I think the government could really just help us make geospatial technology cool for the next generation. The Dutch cadaster years ago loaded um, the uh, their cadaster into um, into a children's video game, and um, it was just really incredible that kids were able to walk in and do design work inside their um, inside the application. And I think that's just a great way to get the next generation of geospatial technologies into into it via, via Minecraft, something that we are, we as parents all struggle with. But it's great to see that that tool can be used to help them get the uh, kids into uh, into our technology and into our industry. Can I add something? Okay. Ms. Wetzel? Yeah, sure. Because I think uh, Thomas triggered a thought on me, and I think I'm interested in what my my esteemed colleagues think. I, I was last last week in Berlin. There was an economic forum, and I think it's quite interesting when you talk to the politicians on this side. I think there is. I I think poli politics is the rule maker, and as an industry, we are the rule taker. But there is an issue uh, with regulation. I think they think a lot about what needs to be done and i think they're responsible and ideally i like them to think why and get either a political alignment or a society alignment and let the industry actually develop the innovation and how we solve these problems in a lot of cases the regulation gets in the way because they they think about the what and a lot on how because they kind of try to dictate the solution and the the, the why it gets completely forgotten and I think this is just a, a mental shift, I think, on, on doing that. I think it would help to be much more open to technology and innovation and also allow companies to not be kind of slowed down on, on, on unnecessary hurdles. What do the others think? Then I would like to continue with the 
our topic of artificial intelligence, if this is okay for you, because um, I, I was wondering, um, so when we are looking um, at our industry, at the geospatial industry, surveying engineers and in this regard, so what does um, artificial intelligence integrating autonomous systems, um, robotic systems, um, what does this mean, integrating this in uh, the fields of work and which fields of work will use this new technology, this AI or, um, or robotic um, the most in your point of view? And uh, I would like to start um, maybe with Trimble and Ron. Yeah, so I, I think artificial intelligence is an incredibly uh, exciting area. I, we, I was recently meeting with some people from the Nature Conservancy, one of the largest um, area, one of the largest organizations helping helping the Earth and in improving sustainability. And they were talking about how they were using geospatial and artificial intelligence to help take large amounts of data about coral reef health and then condense it down to an assessment and, and a management plan to help with that. And I think artificial intelligence has a great role in taking all of this incredible data we're connecting and, and condensing it down to something that people can actually help to, to, uh, to monitor and, and manage the assets around the world, important um, areas like coral reefs, um, palm oil plantations, and, and other uh, forests and other areas that, that need that management. Mm -hmm. Thomas Herring, what's the role of artificial artificial intelligence and which fields of work will use the AI the most? Clearly following the lines of Ron, that geospatial data are then really uh, taken, like is uh, captured um, from LiDAR or imaging sensors, and you can look at vegetation, you can uh, do simulations in these digital realities for potential nasal hazard or whatever, and do simulations on that flood, fire, or whatever you think about. That's one. But maybe concrete use case would be in construction as well. I'm not sure I, uh, mm -hmm. whether you know we are market leader in construction insights, meaning that with web temp technology in the US, we can drive with artificial intelligence automated information about activity on a construction site. So we get additional information, which we would have been not able without this technology. We can get safety information, whether somebody wears a helmet or not directly from the system via imaging technology. So these are additional information which have not been there, which provide, provide additional insights and provide additional benefits in terms of productivity, safety, and then of course, and sustainability as well. And there's much more to come, much more concrete use cases where, which we are working with our customers on. That's really fantastic to see that what artificial intelligence can do. I'm always surprised and astonished at that. Thank you. Roland Zelles. But okay, I, to be honest, I think I'm, I am struggling with the word artificial intelligence because I, I question the intelligence in the machine. This maybe you saw in my presentation, I was using the word machine learning a lot. And I, I think that's really, when you step back, what do we want? We don't want the intelligence of the computer. I think what we want is insight to drive actually better insights and automation. And I think, you know, there's, there's multiple good applications you can do like in the construction progress. I think Thomas used an example, I think where we track automatically the construction site um, for safety regulations, water, like the typical problems and helping actually an early warning system for the project manager to make sure, you know, no accidents happen. I think, but as I said, it's, it's you have to train the system and the tr system is only as good as it's trained, um, and we we have to constantly make sure you have human input to make sure the system gets better and gets lets continuous learning. So I think it's 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 a lot of benefit because it can it can work with a huge amount of data. Human cannot con compute and consume at the same time, and then you have to distill it down to insights. But I think this is it needs human intelligence to make the machine learning output uh, intelligent. Thank you. Monica, do you have another question from the chat or anything else you prepared in advance of this talk you'd like to ask right now? There are, uh, there are several hellos from Brazil to all of you. Bom dia. And um, <laughs> they say yeah. that they are using drones in their work, uh, which makes also a big part at the Intergeo. 
So I don't know if uh, the topic drones is also uh, could be a good topic for you to tell uh, anything about it, what is going on in your companies. Yeah, we, we already see one there next to Thomas Herring. Yeah, I am not allowed <laughs> to let it fly inside the building here. Sorry for that. <laughs> Should I, maybe for us, it's not, a, it's not a drone, it's not a UAV, it's a flying sensor. Mm -hmm. So it's a flying reality capture sensor, um, which really captures autonomously the reality capture, um, where the mission planning is done automatically, and where you really, once you have captured all the information, you can stream that point cloud and that imaging data then into whatever ecosystem you're using and whatever software suit you need. So it's not a UAV, it's not a UAV workflow, we have many others as well. It's really complementing our reality capture, our scanning technology, which we have. First, we went mobile with our world's first BRK to go. Then we had um, now the flying, the BRK to go, um, the uh, flying sensor, and of course, with the BRK Arc, the first real autonomous reality capture device for a ro robot with our partnership with Boston Dynamics, for example. And that's, that's something which we see really driving these kind of things. And for us, as I said, flying is important, um, these kind of things, with all the regulations, but it's much more important that the whole workflow works end to end towards HXDR. And I'm hopeful that I can come to Brazil. I love to be there, it's on my list, as many countries, yeah. Let's hope that soon we can meet and we can discuss whether we can use such, such devices underground in mines or in open pit mines or whatever, whatever applications you have, we should look at that together with our teams down there. How can we solve your problems or not if the technology is not ready? Let's find that out. I, I so just Denise? saw that, that I just saw that Lisa Higgins just questions another. I cannot read it. Monica, do you see the whole question? Yeah, just curious how uh, are, how how are each of your panelists or personal level embracing sustainability? Yeah, the question of sustainability. Statements. How much do you embrace that? Clearly not enough, but I have a lot of people around me which remind me quite often to do that. And then I do it yeah, and try to do it. But surely it starts, as we said before, with us, it starts with me. Mm. And there's much more I could do and I will do and I'm trying to do. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm always willing to take the feedback from um, what I can do differently. And that's the same in our company that we have this kind of culture that we really take the input from all the employees, from all the different level and make sustainability as part as a regular decision making process and not an additional process. So it's part of our DNA. Just to add to that, I'm actually really proud of us as an industry because I think we do so much for sustainability. And I think we're almost kind of one of the best kept secrets in, in all that we can do. And I think our companies are getting better about telling the story as well as improving um, our solutions to help with sustainability and help our customers in their role for that. And then at a personal level, you know, I mean, I think every day we make decisions. Should I get on that airplane? Um, you know, should I commute to the office? Those are all kind of things I think we're all making on a personal level. So I think it's everything from the career choices many of us made to get into this great industry down to, you know, am I going to get on that airplane or will I get on a, uh, a Zoom call? So. <laughs> I think I, I, I mentioned also earlier, I'm quite passionate. Sometimes I sound like a Friday for kid, future kid. I'm really passionate about about that and also what we can do and if everybody itself and I think if I, I can encourage people on the, on the audience, you can calculate your own carbon footprint, relatively simple, I think there's enough tools on the web and then mm. you get an idea of what you what you can do or want to do to actually reduce your your footprint and I think there are certain things you cannot avoid and I think you have to be just realistic of what's possible and I think I guess the three of us, I think we also um, contribute bad, badly in some area with the flights, I think, like having a global role and being around the world, I think this is definitely, at least for me personally, while everything is great until I start to enter my flights. Mm. Um, and I think that's something I think where we learned in the pandemic that actually not every flight is needed. And I think tr just making sure that you, you do more than just compensating. Mm. I think you can compensate every flight, but that's not the only, this, the only solution. I think there's less is more probably in that case. Hmm. Um, 
just one last question to the three of you because the theme of interview 2021 is inspiration for a smarter world that means the expo and the conference and so we're just talking about those inspirations like sustainability like machine learning um, and uh, what do you think um, what or What's, what do you think, what inspiration for a smarter world can you provide or want to bring as a message to Intergeo and your customers and the audience at this year's Intergeo? Maybe I'll start since I'll, we'll go reverse order I'll, and I'll end off. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to thank our customers for their incredible role in it and ask them to come to the booth and tell us what we can do to help them because they're doing, they're doing really great work out there. I'm always impressed and amazed at what, our, what everyone's doing. So, uh, and I look forward to, uh, and our team look forward to seeing them and finding out what we can do to help them. Mm -hmm. Thomas, what's I your think... message for inspiration for a smarter world? Continu continue to innovate for a sustainable future by using our collective intelligence in our company, in the whole industry, having dialogues, working together with the peers, the other market players on solutions and sharing ideas, working towards that. And then really trying to push the technology, pair it with domain expertise as we do in so many industries. And then I'm sure we will become all of us much smarter and achieve what we all want to achieve. And for me, I think that actually decarbonization and digitization belong to each other. And I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I was in Berlin last week. I think there's a lot, it, it was nice with the colleagues to talk because I think we are not here as competitors or enemies or anything. I think we try to move the industry forward together. And there's a lot of collective knowledge, I think, where we can influence to, to actually be in a better world. Thank you very much. I guess our time is up. And um, Monica, is there anything you'd like to mention? Yeah, there is one question, but very uh, precise about a suitable product for landslide monitoring. I don't know if there is a short answer, but otherwise- Very short, a very short answer. Yeah. Radar technology, we have the best radar technology, total station technology, and if you combine that, you have a total monitoring solution, which is perfect. And we have great installations in Brazil serving on that. So contact our team there or talk to me. I <laughs> and and you will contact. move to Brazil. <laughs> as you already I'm, I'm always, <laughs> um, always welcome there, I know. You will travel there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So um, thank you. Is there anybody's raising his or her hand? I don't know. No? Okay. Thank you no. very much. Thank you, Ron, Thomas and Roland. Thank you. For Thank your you. insights Thank you for organizing it. and Thanks the motivation and strategies you of your companies. Yes. And uh, please, I hope to see you all next week in Hanover or digitally via the platform. And this was the Intergeo CEO talk and see you next week. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>